right, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, if you would stand with us as we get started with a song. tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken to hide I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken I won't be shaken cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand
honestly. <laughs> so funny. Um, we're also looking for some volunteers. Um, that's probably my fault. I need to turn it on, right? <laughs> oh, that's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> um, we are definitely looking for some volunteers around here. Um, so on Sunday mornings, we need greeters and hospitality, set up and break down, children's church leaders, and even some more. And if you're interested in volunteering, you could email Keith at stpaulswired.org. And so now if you would look at your connection cards, each week we ask everyone to fill these out uh, to let us know who's worshiping with us this morning. There's also a link in our live stream so that you can fill that out online. And um, it's a great way for us to know that you're here or that you're visiting online, good way to keep in touch. And there's also um, a place where you can fill in what any questions that you have, any prayer concerns, um, those are prayed over each week. And uh, we love to be praying for you and anything that's going on in your life. Later in the service, there will be an opportunity to put your card in our offering basket that is underneath our communion table. There's also a basket in the back table that you can put your card in as well. And so at this time, I'd like to ask you to stand for our invocation prayer. This morning's prayer is from Polycarp. May God the Father and the eternal High Priest Jesus Christ build us up in faith and truth and love and grant us our portion among the saints with all those who believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for all believers, for kings and rulers, for the enemies of the cross of Christ, and for ourselves we pray that our fruit may abound and be made perfect in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Here at St. Paul's, we are reintroducing, after over two years, our tradition of greeting one another with the passing of the peace. This is a time in our service where you can say hello to others in the church. Feel free to greet others with whatever is most comfortable for you. Shake hands, wave, or just say hi. And let's start it with this response. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you. Now please take a moment to extend that peace to someone around you.
adjustment in the sound. I don't know if you hear that boom, boom, boom. That's not supposed to be there. All right then. <laughs> All right. 
Not today, Satan. This always happens, right? And you know what? It just tried, Satan tries to block our worship to Christ, but you know what? We gotta look past it and just give him the glory that he deserves, you know? Oh. 
daughters of God. You may be seated. Good morning. morning. Hope you're all doing well today. Well, as you may or may not have heard from Pamela, unfortunately her uh, batteries went dead in the mic. Uh, Pastor Ryan is away with his family this week, so we're going to be taking a uh, brief break from his series on the Apostle Creed. And uh, we could pray this week that Pastor Ryan has a a very relaxing and refreshing week and comes back with uh, lots of energy and things like that. And uh, we're, we're grateful that he's able to have this opportunity to be away. A few weeks ago, I had uh, the privilege of speaking to the UConn football team and leading them uh, in their chapel uh, for their first chapel they had at, at, uh, at UConn. And um, I've been volunteering with Athletes in Action the past couple years. The director, John Vampatella, who some of you may remember from preaching here a few times, asked if I would lead the chapel. And I uh, said, sure, I'd love to. And uh, it was the topic that I discussed, um, something I thought would be really great for, you know, students as they are arriving to campus, I realized was also really powerful to me. So hopefully the same will be true to, for you this morning. I have a question I'd like to start out with, and uh, as you can see, I, that's the, the reason I gave the, the picture in my title is for the UConn team, which is where, we, uh, where, where I did the chapel, but also to give them a little love for the game they had last night. If any of you see it, know, you know what I'm talking about. So we won't go too much further into that. But uh, I have a question for you this morning. What are some factors that affect the quality of your health? And I'm actually looking for an answer. <laughs> Sleep. Sleep. Your diet, for sure. Mental health. Mental health. Money, right? Maybe pay for, for health care, things like that. Well, what if I said that the quality of your life is most determined by the quality of your relationships? In fact, there's a Harvard study that came out a few years ago that said, if you belong to no social groups, so let's say like a bowling club, uh, a book club, a church community, if you belong to one of those groups, and you, or you don't belong to one of those groups, and you decide to join one, you cut your risk of dying in half the next year. I thought that was fascinating. This simple change of joining a group is more important to our health than quitting smoking, exercising, and losing weight. Group connected people with really poor habits consistently outlive disconnected people with healthy habits. This applies to young and old. In fact, the study also found that the single best predictor of someone's health and happiness at the age of 80, again, was not wealth, not your professional success, but the single best predictor was the relationships you had when you were 50. It was a better predictor of physical health than the cholesterol levels were. You know, for me, someone who has really bad cholesterol, when I first read that, I just started instantly texting my buddies, hey, how's it going? (laughs) Anyone who has ever spent time with someone on their deathbed knows how true this is. I have a lot of friends who are pastors and chaplains who tend to people in their final moments, and there's always that common consensus that no one is ever in their last moments asking, hey, can you bring me all my awards that I won through my life? Can you bring me those trophies? I want to set it up around my bed. Bring me that sports car I bought when I was 50. You all know this. People in their final moments of life want to be surrounded by the people they love. So again, the quality of your life is most determined by the quality of your relationships. And most of the time, we collect, we connect closely with a small, limited number of people. Some of you might be sitting here thinking, yeah, right, you should see my Facebook account. I have dozens, hundreds of friends I connect with. I have hundreds of friends pouring into my life. This cannot be any more true on your birthday. I now get dozens, possibly hundreds of messages on my birthday, some by by people I haven't talked to in years. And while I'm so appreciative that people are reaching out and wishing me a happy birthday, I realize I haven't seen this person in 20 years. (laughs) If we're not careful, this can give us like a really false sense of reality. Social media does a, a super good job of disguising true connection for us. Enough that they say we are actually living in the pandemic of loneliness. There's all these articles that continue to come out that are connecting social media 
to the fact that we are the one of the most angriest, depressed, loneliest generations that ever existed. Pretty encouraging, right? <laughs> and one of the reasons for this is that we can craft an image of ourselves instead of connecting with hearts. As you can see, this, uh, this picture of my family behind me, unfortunately they couldn't be here today. Carson wasn't feeling too well, but uh, this is a great picture of me and my family, right? I, use, I even use it as my Facebook cover photo. But what you guys don't see is what took to get this picture. <laughs> as you can see in the background, you have people walking around. Well, this was Chase's middle school graduation. What 13-year-old wants to take a picture with his family when he's surrounded by all of his closest friends, right? And then when we get set up for the picture, obviously you gotta find someone to take it. That's always a challenge. Then you got the sun in your eyes, so we gotta switch positions and everybody's shifting. You know, someone trips, cries, gets hurt, the baby won't smile. You know, this is probably four or five takes in. And that's exactly what social media does to us, right? It allows us the freedom to put our best image forward. So even though this might be five, six, seven shots in, this is the one we put up. And oftentimes, these pictures go on our Facebook pages with a perfect day at Chase's graduation. Or, you know, my favorite, hashtag blessed. <laughs> But, but any of you who have families, you know how hard it is to take a family photo and what goes into that. It, it, and uh, when we put our best image forward on social media and in our lives, it allows us to cover up the mess to show the world, hey, look at me, I got this good life going on, right? It's possible for us to be connect, more connected but less intimate than ever before. We need to be careful not to confuse proximity with intimacy and approval or admiration with connection. Getting likes is not the same thing as being loved. And you can get more views, but still be less known. This especially applies to those in the sports world. I told you I did this for the, the UConn football team, so I have a couple sports illustrations today, so hopefully uh, if, if you're not a sports fan, you could bear with me. But uh, so many of us, you know, we see athletes or coaches perform, you know, a couple hours a week. And we think we know who that person is, right? Just by their performance or by an interview or a snapshot or a quote they say afterwards. We think we got that person nailed down. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. But we don't really truly know, you know, an athlete. We don't know who a coach is. One example of this, many of you might know, I, I used to work with the UConn women's basketball team. Before I got the job, I heard so many people tell me about Coach Gino, Ariema. You know, they would tell me how cocky he is, how he's a pompous guy, how, uh, you know, he's bad for the, the women's sport, or he only wins because he gets the best players. He was criticized for how blunt he was in press conferences. But most people, they don't see what goes on behind the scenes. They don't see the blood, sweat, tears that the coaches and the players often put into the game and that go into every single day of their practices. They don't see the, the time that the coaches are on the road recruiting players, talking to these players and connecting with them. And they don't see how great he was to his staff, how, how nice he was and how kind. Right? They just see what he, he, what he is on the sideline and they see what he is in the press conference. But one of the things that burns him up the most and really like touches his soul is when they don't win a championship. And many people, again, think, oh, he didn't get a ring. But the thing that really eats him up the most is that he just told that player that, hey, come to UConn, I'm gonna get you a championship. You're gonna win a championship here. So when they don't do that, it really hurts them. So even though we have these tools that connect us with dozens and hundreds of people, if we get real with ourselves, most of us, we're only truly connecting with a few people in our lives. Beyond that, we spend considerably less time with the next closest uh, group of friends. And so it goes to the outer limits of our relational networks. And whether it's subconscious or not, all of us give a small circle of people permission to shape us. Our thinking, our convictions, our worldviews, and sometimes even our future. This isn't like a formal agreement you go into a friend with, but it's more like an unspoken understanding. There's very simple but powerful illustrations I found on this as I was researching the topic from a pastor named Josh Howerton. Throughout Jesus' ministry, we know that there were huge crowds that followed him around. And at the end of his ministry, there were about 100, 120 or so people who were followers of Jesus, who fell into this outer circle. I'm going to call this the caring circle. 
they weren't his core group, but they were people he cared for. And I think a lot of these people cared for him. If they were sick or needed something, Jesus was there to heal them. He was there to help them. These, and, and we have about 100 or 120 so people in our circle of network of friends. Most of us. These are people that we know, you know, if they need something, we'll shoot them a text, we'll send them a gift card, we'll be there for them. This group can be a variety of people in our lives. We know for Jesus it included tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners, of all kinds. The Bible says that Jesus was friendly with many, but only friends with a few. So about 100 or so people. And then within this group, we know that there were 12 that were true disciples of Jesus. They went with him wherever he went. There was mutual influence, which is the second spear. This is who Jesus taught and shared his life with. Jesus influenced them, and there were times where they influenced Jesus. And in our lives, you may notice, we probably have about 12 to 15 people who have mutual influence with us. You'll share ideas with, you'll influence them, they'll, they'll have strong influence over you. But within this 12, Jesus had three. Three people who went with him everywhere. Peter, James, and John. One example in the Bible takes place in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus broke down weeping. He allowed these three to see the true and raw him. He invited them into his life. And for you, you're going to have an intimacy with about three to four people who are your people, right? They're your crew. They're the people who know you the best and you know them the best. Some may believe that you could be in, unaffected by this core group, right? This closeness group, your inner circle. It's so easy to convince ourselves that, no, it's not going to happen to us. People aren't going to affect who I am. It's far better to acknowledge and embrace the reality of relational influence and to prayerfully consider who we permit to have that influence in our lives. You know, I see this in our kids all the time. Carson picks up things that we say, even at the age of three, that we scratch our heads and we say, where the heck did he come up with that? One of the ones is, uh, seriously. So if he, something doesn't go his way, seriously? <laughs> right? He doesn't come up with that on his own. A few hours later, we hear the same phrase coming out of our older two kids' mouths. And this happens everywhere in our life, our social circles, especially at the workplace, while hanging with friends. The more we are around someone, the more we eventually start to become like them. So if you were to start from scratch and choose an inner circle, who would be in your inner circle? What would you want to be true of them? The book of Proverbs is uh, just a great book with just a lot of little nuggets of wisdom. And one of those nuggets is from Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. It doesn't get much straightforward than this. The Bible is saying, spend time with the people you want to be like. Because you and your friends will surely grow to be like each other. So here's a couple examples of this, like both negative and positive. Whoever walks with the successful will become successful. Whoever walks with a partier will become a partier. Whoever walks with the studious will become someone who studies and cares about their grades. Whoever walks with committed, loving spouses will become a committed, loving spouse. Another way to say this is that your closest friends will eventually become the future you. I found out the meaning of this verse the hard way. When I first uh, arrived at college, I had a roommate um, who I got to know. I didn't know him beforehand, but he was a, a Christian guy. And uh, within the first two or three weeks, he decided to transfer. So as a freshman in college, it was kind of cool having your own room. But then my girlfriend from high school broke up with me. Then I didn't do too well on my first couple grades. I found myself in my dorm room late at nights, you know, wondering, where's my, where's my group? <laughs> you know, the guys from high school who I hung out with, who protected me, where are they? So I started to wonder. I wandered down the hall and I found another group. This group wasn't the best influence on me. Started drinking, started smoking, things I've never did before getting to college. And I found myself wondering, who am I? I'm not, this isn't the person I am. Thankfully, within about 
in, somewhere in between the first and second semester of schooling, I kind of snapped out of it and I realized this isn't, my, this isn't my inner group. This isn't my core group. And I started going back to where my room was. And in between, ironically, was another group that I started to hang with. These guys were guys who attended chapel every week. These guys were guys who were got involved in extra activities like student government. One of the guys and I started a television show with, with our local uh, Philadelphia uh, television station at LaSalle. And I realized this was my group. This is the people I wanted to be like. If Tracy was here right now, she would probably take, stand up and take a little bow. This is the part where I met Tracy. And we started to connect. And uh, it hit me as I was preparing for this message that a few years ago I was, um, hang I was uh, meeting with a friend or a relative actually in a, uh, a place where you go and, and get, and get uh, sober and it was a rehab facility. And I was met with them on Christmas Day. And while I was there visiting, uh, I stayed for the speech that day. The person who gave the speech looked really, really familiar. Wouldn't you know, it was one of those people in my original crew. He was telling me and telling the group the importance of, of being sober and, and what, what being sober could do for your life and things like that. A few months later, I found out that person actually died. He overdosed. And it just, as I thought about this message, I, I just realized, you know, that could have been me. That could have been me with that group. Thankfully, I was spared. So again, I ask, what do you want to be true of the people you walk with? One of the reasons I want each of you to answer this for yourself is because no one can answer that question for you. Each of us were created differently, and each of us have different qualities we would want to possess, and therefore want those closest to us to possess. I'm going to go through a few qualities that as I get older, these are what I want my inner circle to be. Maybe you'll find them valuable as well. The first one, I, people who are grounded in the gospel. I'm going to, if you have your Bibles today, if you want to pull them out and turn to Mark, I'm going to be reading from Mark 2. Uh, just to set the stage, though, for you, in Mark 1, uh, this is when Jesus, uh, especially towards the end of Mark 1, is where he really gets to get started into his ministry. He's starting to teach people. He's starting to heal people. He's starting to really start drawing crowds to him, crowds that were so large that they couldn't really stay in one place, so they had to keep traveling. So he starts off in Capernaum, and then travels to other places. Well, Mark 2 sets the stage where he's returning back to Capernaum from Galilee. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get to him because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat that he was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. I tell you, get up. Skipping down to verse 11. I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. So we see in this passage a man who was healed. But what did he do to deserve that healing? What did he do to find Jesus? Not much, right? When Jesus saw their faith, the faith of his friends, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. It had nothing to do with him, but his friends were so dedicated to getting him to Jesus. Put yourself in that situation today. What does that look like? Being surrounded by a building, you know, maybe obviously smaller than this, but getting, wanting to be so close to Jesus to heal your friend that you would do anything to get to him. Climbing up on a roof, digging through the materials, lowering the, the person down on a mat. Any of you who have ever tried to carry a man know it's tough. Even with four guys, it's tough. I can't even imagine lifting him up. But nothing was going to stop these guys from getting their friend to Jesus. So... The first and, and most important attribute of those in my inner circle are people who truly live lives that are reflected by the gospel. The idea that Jesus lived and died for us so that we could someday return to him in heaven. 
So people who have this conviction that all of life flows from knowing God and following him. Without this foundation, our inner circle will look to the world to solve problems. But with a foundation rooted, rooted in the gospel, that inner circle will always point and bring us back to Christ, no matter what it takes. Even if it means pulling out all the stops, like hoisting you up on a roof and physically ripping through it to get you down on a mat to be at Jesus' feet. The next quality that I look for in an inner group of friends is the willingness to speak truth. But not just to speak the truth, but to speak it in love. At St. Paul's, we like to describe the vision of our church community with three words. Truth, grace, and life. And that first word, truth, is such an important one. Most of the following uh, that I'm about to talk about could be found right on our website that was written by Pastor Ryan. To be filled with truth means to seek to see things as they actually are. We have a natural tendency to believe whatever confirms our interested, self-interested biases. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. You know, we have such a, a political divide in our country right now. People on the far right are going to watch far right news networks. People on the left are going to watch far left news networks. Because we want to hear what, what validates us. We want to hear people affirm and agree with what we already think, whether it's true or not. But when we're filled with truth, we care too much about what's real to hide from any facts that disturb our illusions. Being filled with truth means being honest about who we are. It means including our moral, moral, including our moral failures and our mistakes. It means being able to say, you know what, I was wrong and I'm really sorry. And sometimes you have to say that more than once. Being filled with the truth means being able to admit the limits of our own knowledge. Sometimes it means being able to say, I don't know. I'll look into that for you. It's one of the reasons I love Pastor Ryan's preaching here so much. Right? If he doesn't know something, he'll, he'll, he'll help us to, to find the answers. He'll, he'll encourage us to go look for it on our own. He never tries to, to say something that he doesn't know is true. And I love that about him. He, he's very humble. Being filled with the truth means not allowing our feel, feelings to reign over facts. Feelings are really important. But when we allow them to have too much authority in our lives, they can definitely lead us astray. And throughout human history, people have given undue authority to feelings of hate, fear, racism, pride, which often lead to very devastating results. So being filled with the truth means being able to speak it, even when it's really unpopular. Ephesians 4, verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Part of the permission we give to those in our inner circle is that freedom to, you know, completely be honest with us, even if we don't particularly like what we're going to be here. If those in our inner circle aren't willing or able to tell us the truth, then this permission is pointless. And again, truth telling is to be done with humility and discernment. Is the truth we're telling someone, is it used to edify them or is it used to like hurt and break them down? Always have to keep that in our mind when we're telling someone the truth. And then the final thing that I, I look for in my inner circle, the final quality, is the ability to promote and preserve unity. This is something that, you know, many people might not consider when you're looking for a, a close friend, but in today's culture, I think it's so super important. Unity is a huge deal to God. Jesus talked about it often while he was on earth. And unity in the church is one of the final things he prayed for before leaving his earth, like we see in John 17. In Proverbs, uh, returning to the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verses 16 to 19, the author points out six things that the Lord hates. And the last thing is a, fa a false witness who pours out lies and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. So when we're looking for someone to be in that inner circle in our lives, we need to look for the amount of conflict surrounding those closest to you. Not only pay attention to how those in your inner circle treat you, but how are they talking about the people outside of your circle? Are they gracious? Are they empathetic to others and kind-hearted? Or are they critical, condescending, slanderous? If you've ever been on a team at, at, at your workplace, you've probably been around someone who might be like this. Someone who's constantly putting down the boss or talking about your coworkers. It's really easy to get sucked into that world, to, to start participating in those conversations. And eventually, if enough people are participating, it could do a major 
harm to your company or orga organization. You know, and that includes churches alike. So if God pri pri prioritizes unity, then our inner circle needs to consist of people who choose to look for the best in, in others and avoid drama. So again, I ask you this morning, who are the types of people you want in your inner circle? If there's something in your life that you want to become, a harder worker, a better student, a better athlete, a more compassionate leader, and ultimately a more devoted follower of Christ, then we need to be sure that our inner circle is filled with people who are committed to getting there, getting us there no matter what it takes. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we give you thanks for this morning, Lord. We thank you, thank, give you thanks for the abilities to, to be able to meet freely to worship you. Lord, and as Leah said, Satan's not going to bring us down today. Lord, we ask this morning that you would fill our lives with people in our inner circle who are edifying you and edifying us, Lord. People who are building us up and not breaking us down. People who are encouraging us to not listen to the world, but to follow you to follow the words in your scriptures. Lord, we thank you for preserving these, these sacred scriptures of yours. We thank you for filling us with people in this room who are loving and who meet the, the criteria that you want in our lives. And Lord, help us each and every day to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus the name above Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you.
This is the point in our service where we receive an offering and share in communion together, where we celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Giving is really important to us here at St. Paul's. It's important to us as individuals, as we put our trust and our faith in the Lord with our finances. It's also important to us as a church community. Everything we do here comes from the generous offerings and tithes that we receive from our, gener our members and our attenders, and for that, we say thank you very, very much. You know, this morning I talked about, you know, that outer core and how, you know, Jesus' Jesus's outer, core, outer core might have consisted of about 100, 120 so people, and that might be true for you in your life. And you might be sitting here today saying, I don't know 100 people. I'm not close with 100 people. But you know what? If you're here in this place, you are. You're surrounded by those people right now. And you're surrounded by people who are, have a, a bunch of the qualities that I talked about, right? This table represents some of those qualities. It's a place that's centered in the gospel, but it's also one of the, the unifying thing that brings us all together. So it doesn't matter, you know, how different our differences in this room, in this space, this is the place where we're unified. If you're here this morning and you're thinking to yourself, I don't know this Jesus person that you're talking about, but he sounds awesome, we would love to meet with you sometime this week. We would love me or Pastor Ryan would be happy to have a conversation with you. The only uh, qualifier for coming up here today is that you pro profess and proclaim Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And again, if you're struggling to find that, uh, we would ask you that you would pass on the, the, the bread and the wine at this time, but please be encouraged to uh, reflect on the message that you just heard, and, and again, be encouraged to talk to one of us if you want to learn more. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, took the bread. After he had given thanks to his Father in heaven, he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, once again, in the covenant of his blood, he said, drink in remembrance of me. So as you feel called this morning and as you feel ready, please come forward and receive God's holy gifts for God's beloved people. Yeah. 
stand with us as we close with a song. I once was fatherless, a stranger with no hope, your kindness waking Waken me from my sleep Your love it beckons deep A call to come and die By grace now I will come Take this life, take your life Sin has lost its power Death has lost its Stains now clean. Your breath fills up my lungs. Now I'm free. Now I'm free. My dead heart now is beating. My deepest stains now clean. Your breath fills up my lungs. Now I'm free. Now I'm free. Sin has lost its power. Thank you uh, again so much for being here to worship with us this morning. Before we leave, I, uh, one more call to action. So I talked about, you know, how do you get that at large outer circle? And again, being here is a great start. But how do you get to the inner cores, right? 
this might be a shameless plug, but it's one of the best ways to do that is in a small group. I mean, a small group is just that, a group of eight to 10 people who are, are looking out for your interest and hopefully you're looking out for them. Another way is to join a volunteer team. Again, that's a plug for the volunteer teams, but at the same time, it's one of those ways that we could really uh, bond by, by serving together. Some of the people who I've met here and got closest to are people who I serve with. So uh, those are a couple ways that if, if you're looking to get, you know, get down to that inner circle and meet some people who you want in your life to be, you know, like the things I talked about, that's a great way to start. So as we uh, leave here today, let's say our benediction together. While our service here has now ended, our worship has not ended. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve his people. Amen.